The following is another dynamic message by Benny Hamm. This exciting teaching can change your life. Now, here's Pastor Benny. Now, we are talking about worship. Like I told you last night, I'll say it this morning again, that the tabernacle is the road map the Lord gave us into His presence. It's a pattern showing and revealing to us the way into the holiest, which is the Holy of Holies. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through verse 8, the Word of the Lord says this to us, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, for there, were, for there was a tabernacle made. The first wherein was the candlestick, the table of the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holies of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly, but we will tonight, and our promise is going to change our life. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. Say those words, not without blood. Say it again, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now, all of you say with me, the way into the holiest. Now, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 4 and 5 tells us there is a heavenly tabernacle now and eternally. And what we're looking at is a shadow of the true. Verse 4 and 5 says, For if he were on earth, he should, be, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts, gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. <clears throat> there is a heavenly pattern, there is an earthly pattern. Now, how many of you truly want to worship God, say amen. amen. You have to follow the heavenly pattern. You cannot enter into God's presence without following the road map into God's presence, and the road map is the tabernacle. The Bible says we come to His gates with thanksgiving, and that gate is Jesus, because that gate has four colors. You remember from last night? Look at your notes again, please. One more time, I'm going to ask you questions. If, if you remember, there were four, four, four different colors, blue and purple, scarlet and white, right? And remember, I told you that the Gospels have colors, right? Because Jesus is presented in a different light, in a different revelation in every Gospel. In Matthew, he's the king. In Mark, he's the man. In Luke, he's the Savior. John, the Son of God, correct? Now, we, we put the colors with the Gospels, and we come out with what? We come out with purple for Matthew, white for Mark, scarlet for Luke, and blue for John. God said to Moses, I want four colors, for these are the revelations of who Jesus is. He's the king. Man, Savior, Son of God. King, I obey Him. Man, identify with Him. Savior, trust Him. Son of God, worship Him. 
Now, when you come to Jesus and you see him in these four revelations, that's introduction. That's the first step into God's presence. Now, we come through that gate, we come through Christ with thanksgiving. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Psalm 100 verse 4. Now we stand in the, in the courts and we experience praise. Praise because of our deliverance from sin. And now we praise him. But sadly, many have mistaken praise for worship. And they're not the same because we thank him for goodness, praise him for his greatness. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. We worship him for his holiness. And holiness demands a revelation. Can't worship God till I know who God is. And God is holy. And when I say holy, I speak of his totality. See, I can say God is good, and I never speak of his totality. I can say God is just. I can never present his totality. I can say God is merciful, and I'm not speaking of his totality. I can say he's gracious, loving, kind. None of these present his, his totality. When I say holy, I speak of his totality. That's why the angels don't, don't cry merciful, merciful. They cry holy, holy, holy. Holy, you worship him for his holiness. We do not worship him for greatness or goodness, but holiness. Why? Because holiness presents the totality of his being. Is that clear to you? Say holiness, holiness. is the totality of God. Say it again. And every time you say you are holy, the presence of God comes. So, but that demands a revelation. I cannot know God as holy till he tells me who he is. I have to see him as he is. I can look at the stars and see his greatness. I can see people healed and see his power and greatness. And I can praise him for that. But when God reveals himself to me, I cry, holy. Therefore, the angels of heaven cry, holy, 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 in response to revelation. Shall I say that again? The angels cry, holy. Why? Because God is revealing himself to the angels. And with every revelation, holy. And by the time they're through saying holy, another revelation comes. So in heaven... We're, we're going to cry holy, 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 not because we'll be programmed to say that. We'll be responding to revelation. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> Think about God will be revealing himself forever to us. These minds can't, can't understand God. They can't fathom God. These minds cannot. One of these days, we're, we're going to receive the full revelation of God, and it will take eternity to do it. For he is eternal. And every time God reveals himself, holy, another revelation, holy, another revelation. That's why the angels cry, holy, 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 holy. They're in school, my friend. That's why they're crying holy. The angels are seeing who God is and cry holy. Isn't it marvelous? Now, the pattern is right here. This is, this is the roadmap to worship. At the gate, I see Jesus. Now, the next thing I face is this altar. This is a most, most important matter. Because this brazen altar speaks of the cross, the work of redemption, the sacrificial death of Christ Jesus. And you cannot bypass it. Now notice four horns around the altar. Romans 3.25 speaks of forgiveness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 speaks of deliverance from sin. Romans 6.6 6 
speaks of the death of the old life. And Romans 12.1 speaks of the offering of one's body to the Lord. And that uh, is what these four represent. Four horns say forgiveness. Say it again. That is found in Romans 3.25. We are forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5.21 speaks of deliverance from sin. That's the second horn of the altar. The third horn of the altar, the death of the old man. Romans 6.6, 6, it says you're dead. But don't forget what we're commanded to do in Romans 12. The Bible says we are to offer our bodies as what? That's what it happens. That's the fourth horn of the altar. When you offer your body, you do it as a result of the fact that the old man is dead, Romans 6, 6. You've been delivered from the power of sin, 2 Corinthians 5. And you've been forgiven, Romans 3, 25. So now, because I'm forgiven, because I've been delivered from the power of sin, because the old man is dead, now my body is ready to be an offering. That's the four horns of the altar. I wish I have a whole hour just to teach on the four. I'm just giving them to you now because I know you need them. Because you may not understand why Paul the apostle said, offer your body as a living sacrifice and then he said, what? It's your act of worship. I'm glad he said that because worship is born at the altar. Worship is born by the offering of my body as a sacrifice. By the surrender of my body, worship is born. Worship is not born at the gate of introduction. That's where thanksgiving is born. It erupts out of my soul. Worship is not born in the, in the court between the gate and the altar of sacrifice because that's where praise is born. Praise is in the courts. Enter into its courts with praise. Remember that? Are you learning anything? Now, at the altar, worship is born because the second I give my body, it's an act of worship. Therefore, worship is born with the death of the flesh. When you place your body on that altar and the blessed act of worship is a reality, you are ready for the next revelation of worship. Introduction, you meet Jesus in fullness. Brazen altar of sacrifice, you're delivered from sin, the power of sin, the old life. You offer your body, living sacrifice. Total death, for it speaks of the cross. Now, you face the labor. As you see, that the labor is again bronze, not gold. And, and this is something I really haven't had time to say. The outer court is bronze. Everything in the outer court speaks of suffering, death. I got to die. There's no bronze inside the holy place or the holy of holies. It's all gold. But this is bronze. This speaks of death. Bronze is death. Brazen altar, death. And now I face another death, sanctification. Say sanctification. Now, very interesting, God said to Moses, he said, I want you to, be, uh, to build this labor out of the mirrors women used. That's Exodus 38, 8. In Exodus 38, verse 8. He said, I want you to build it from the, 
from the brass women use to look at themselves, from mirrors. And then we find something amazing in James 1.23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Here the Bible compares the Bible to a mirror. God said, make sure to build it from mirrors, brass used for mirrors. And he said, fill it with water. And the priests were to wash hands and feet before ministry. Hands and feet speaks of work and walk. Now today, would you turn to John 13? John 13, all of you please. Jesus said in John 13, 10, he said, you are clean except your feet. In the old covenant, they, they washed hands and feet because they lived by work and walk. Today, we're commanded only to wash our feet. Therefore, our walk must be washed by the word of the living God. So John 13, 10 says, you are clean except your feet. Now, precious people of God, this is something very, very important that the Master says to us. He who is washed needs not to save wash, but his feet, but is clean every wet. You're clean, but not all. But, he said, your feet must be washed. Your walk continually washed. Paul the Apostle in Romans 8.13 said, Mortify the deeds of the flesh. That's what Jesus is talking about. What is it to wash your feet? What does it mean? It's the washing of the flesh. It's the death of the flesh. Mortify the deeds of the flesh, Romans 8.13 says. Something is quite amazing. Gentlemen, do you remember when Joab heard that Solomon was about to kill him? What did he do? Remember that? He laid hold of the horns of the altar. Why? Because he understood by the Scripture to lay hold on the horns of the altar you hold claim to the whole sanctuary. You claim the whole sanctuary as you grab one of the horns of the altar. Earlier I told you, say it with me, forgiven. forgiven. Say it again. Forgiven. Romans 3 what? You got it. Delivered from sin. Say it. Say it again. Second Corinthians what? You got it. The death of the old life. Say it. What scripture? Romans 6, 6. Offer your body a living sacrifice. Romans 12. Right. Any one of these claims the whole tabernacle. The minute you claim forgiveness, you claim the whole tabernacle. You claim the right to the whole house of God. All right. Uh, Exodus 21, 14 says that. 1 Kings 1, 50 says that. And 1 Kings 2, 28 says that. They could not touch a man nor kill him if he touched one of those horns. Even though a sinner... Even though deserving death, the minute he laid hold of one of the horns of the altar, none could touch him. God said, to kill him, you had to drag him away from the horn of the altar. Exodus 21, 14, God says, 
You can't kill them if they're holding on to the altar. You can't touch them if, you're hold, if they're holding on to the altar. How many have claimed forgiveness? How many have claimed forgiveness? Nobody can touch you. They'd have to drag you away to kill you. My God, my God, my God. To lay hold on the altar is to lay claim to the sanctuary. To lay hold on the, on the altar, you're out loud saying, I have every right to be legally protected by the presence of God. My God, my God, my God, my God. When I say, watch this, when I say, I am forgiven, brother, the demons of hell would have to drag me away from the cross to kill me. None can punish me as long as I hold on to the altar. The presence of God is my defense. Claim that forgiveness. Claim that deliverance from sin. Claim the death of the old man. And put your body on the altar so none can touch it. No devil. Brother, the reason Christians have demons is their bodies are not on the altar yet. No demon can touch you if you're on this altar. Anybody getting this? You claim the whole sanctuary. And that's why the Bible, and here again, just if you don't mind, those scriptures are incredible. Absolutely incredible. In 1 Kings 150, Adonijah, son of David, had claimed the throne. And Solomon had the throne by right, and Adonijah wanted to steal it. And he knew... That King Solomon was going to kill him. What did he do? He came and touched the horn. And said, I lay, I lay claim to the protection of the tabernacle. Joab did the same thing in 1 Kings 2.28. When he knew Solomon was about to kill him, he laid hold of the altar. He said, I lay claim to the whole sanctuary. And they could not touch them. Nobody could kill them. They had to drag them away physically. They had to drag them away from the altar to kill them. My brother, as long as you hold on to the altar, no demons in hell can touch you ever. Now I lift your hands and thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. For that is your place of safety and protection. That's where you claim the whole blessing of the sanctuary. Now and only now are you ready for the labor. Now you face the labor. The word of God. And now you wash in it. Can I say something? The Word of God is only effective in washing the dead. I'm going to say it again. If you're not dead, this will do you no good. The labor is not for the living. It's for the dead. Romans 12, 1 says, offer your body a living sacrifice acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and then, and only then can you wash. That's why, that's why if somebody hasn't died yet, the Word of God will have no impact on them. That's why people read the Bible and don't know what they read. Five minutes later, they, they have forgotten it. The Word has not taken hold of them. Why? They're not dead yet. The Word of God has no impact on the living. Its impact is only on the dead. You, you've got to die to yourself. Die to your desires. Die to your sins. Die. Just die on that altar and watch what God will do with you. But when you're dead, 
the word will work. And now you're commanded to wash just your feet, just your walk, because you touch dirt. And what you're now realizing, it's that's the progression into the presence of the Lord. I'm amazed, I'm really amazed, how many people have mistaken the court for the Holy of Holies. They stand here and praise. Hallelujah, bless you Lord, amen, amen, amen. And you know, it's a blessed place, it's a place of victory, but it's not the place of transformation. Or the place of communion. Or the place of fellowship. And thousands of people are listening to praise tapes. Millions of dollars have been made on praise tapes. And all that ministry is the outer court ministry. Not the Holy of Holies. They say, I'm in the Holy of Holies. Well, if you are, you ought to be changed. Because it's a place of change in there. Nobody comes out the same. How many are ready to go in all the way? Of course. Now, the labor, the labor is that place which belongs to those who have surrendered completely here at the altar. And the Bible says it's the mirror. In other words, God's Word begins to reveal to you your spiritual condition. If you don't receive a revelation of yourself as you read the Bible, it's having no impact on you. Because the Scriptures reveal you. That's what James 1.23 says. It's like looking in a mirror. Well, a mirror tells me if my hair is combed or not combed, if, if my face looks good or not good or whatever. So the Word of God reveals not the physical, but the spiritual. Reveals your inward spiritual conditions. But it's not just a, a mirror that reveals, it's also water that cleanses. There's two, two things about the labor. It's a mirror, it reveals to me my condition, but there's water in it to cleanse my condition. God supplied two things in this. It reveals, it washes. Say, it reveals and washes. Yeah, so when I read the Word, I say, oh, look at, look at, at, at the difference be, be, between what God says and me. God says, this is what I should be like, but I'm not like that. Now, because it's, it's showing me what I am and what I'm not. And now, it also washes my life washes my walk. You cannot enter God's presence without the washing of this precious book. That's why Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, the Bible says Jesus washes the church with the water of the Word. He washes us with His Word. Hallelujah. And the Word of God says clearly that once you are washed, you are through with the realm of the body. That's why it's all brazen. That's what the body is dealt with. The flesh is dealt with in this arena, still called the court. Say after me, the realm of the flesh is the gate, the altar of sacrifice, and the labor. Say it again. The realm of the flesh is the gate, altar of sacrifice, labor. That's what the flesh is dealt with. You come to Jesus, still in the flesh. You come to the cross, the flesh dies. You come to the labor, you're cleansed from the impurities of the flesh completely. And the Word reveals the hidden deeds of the flesh. So in this, I'm reconciled. In this, I'm sanctified. I'm training you today how to enter in. You can't enter into God's presence till first you come to Jesus and see Him in fullness as King, Man, Savior, Son of God. 
I identify with him, trust him, worship him. Now I see him in his four revelations, four offices. And now I'm ready for the cross. I'm washed, cleansed, and offered my body living sacrifice. I'm ready for the labor. And the scripture says the water of the word will sanctify me wholly. And now I'm ready to enter in. I won't be allowed in till I finish this process. Three revelations. Gate, altar, lever. How many of you so far have understood what I said? Put your hands way up high. Marvelous. Now, we're through with the realm of the body. Listen to me carefully. The body can praise, but the body can't worship. The body can utter. That's about all it can do. The utterance of the lips is where praise exists. And how sad. That's where most people live. Now I enter the realm of the soul. I enter in where the lamp stands, stands to my left, and the table of showbread to my right, and the altar of incense, golden, may I add, in front. Now, something I want to point out. God said to Moses, I want the gate to be held by poles made with acacia wood that speaks of incorruptible flesh. That's the flesh of Christ Jesus that saw no corruption. He said, I want the altar of sacrifice to be built with the same wood and covered with brass. Therefore, this is Christ who died. He's the perfect man who suffered. Brass is suffering. I want the labor also to be built of the same. There's wood in these furnitures. Christ is the wood hidden within, incorruptible flesh, covered with brazen, still the suffering Messiah. Never forget, this is the suffering Savior. He's still the suffering Word. Don't ever forget what I just said. There's death and death. Reconciliation and sanctification are in that process of death. Death, the death of the body comes to an end when I pass the labor. Now I'm ready to enter into the holy place where the lamb stand and the table of showbread and the table of incense stand or the altar of incense. But here's something different. There is no brass in there. Amazingly, there's wood, Christ, and gold, divinity. This is a piece of gold, divinity. Wood and gold, divinity. The ark, wood and gold, except for the mercy seat, all gold. Reasons why? I'm going to tell you tonight about the Ark of the Covenant. It's going to be amazing to you. There are no meaningless details in the Bible. Everything here represents not only Christ Jesus, but you. This is the realm of the flesh, right up to here. It must be dealt with daily. If you want to enter into God's presence, you cannot enter into God's presence till you meet Christ Jesus in fullness, still in the realm of the flesh, die in the realm of the flesh, be sanctified in the realm of the flesh, and then you enter into the realm of the soul where the mind, the will, and emotions exist. Now you enter in. Leaving the outer court, I face what is called the door. Before you go in, there are five, one, two, three, four, five pillars that separate the outer court, the realm of the flesh, before I walk into the realm of the soul. Covered with a first covering, there are two veils. The first and the second veil. 
we only think of the second veil that is the separation between holy place, holy of holies. But we never forget that there is also a cover here, the first veil. The first veil is held by five pillars. Now this is fascinating. How many of you want to enter in beyond the realm of the flesh and go into the holy place? Say amen. amen. You must then understand the five pillars and you must understand the veil that the five pillars hold and why and how to get through. The five pillars represent the fivefold ministry of the church and nobody can enter into the holy place without the help of those five. Put, put your hand up like that. Put your thumb out like this. Say, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these hold what is called the door into the holy place. You can't get in without them. You can't be prepared without them. God won't let you in till you've been affected and touched by the ministry of those five. You can't rush in. You're going to be influenced by, those, by the ministry of those five. When an apostle, who may I add is one who has been a prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, because what is an apostle? Would you mind doing something? It's amazing. God gave you a revelation right in your hand. Would you look at your hand? The only finger that can touch all four is which one? The thumb. Why? Because that's the apostle who can do all other ministries. Who's the apostle? The apostle is the man who has been a prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. None of the other fingers can touch all the rest except one. Can you touch all your fingers with any other finger except your? Of course not. Why? Only the apostle can prophesy, evangelize, pastor, and teach. That's what qualifies you. Now that's the apostle. Don't you dare call an apostle a man who has not been in all four offices because only my thumb can touch all four. This is the man who says, thus saith the Lord. Right? Who's he? A prophet. And this is the one who preaches the gospel to the world. Evangelist. And this is the teacher, the nice man who you can wear a ring around him. And this is the teacher, the little guy who can get into places nobody can. And bring stuff out. I like that. But the apostle touched all four. Now, the hand is the door. And these five offices make up the hand of God. When they influence my life, the way is open before me. Now, there's something else about this amazing door, and I don't have all the time to give you every detail, but in the Scriptures, it represents Christ's resurrection. For I cannot enter in till I know the power of His resurrection. Death, death, but the door, resurrection. And beyond this, there's no brass, there's only gold, only divinity. Now, amazingly, from the outside, it looks quite ugly. What the world looks at says, ah, no beauty we should desire. But to the believer who goes in, it's heaven. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, as we walk in to the holy place, something glorious happens. Go to Colossians 3, 1. Colossians 3, 1. We leave the outer court, we come and pass through the first veil, Christ's resurrection. Now we look and hear us to our left, a lampstand, to our right, table of showbread, in front, the golden altar of incense. And the Word of God says this to us here. If ye 
then be risen with Christ. Verse 1, Colossians 3 says, Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Within this blessed holy place, three main objects. Before I deal with the lampstand, I want to deal with the table of showbread because I believe this is extremely important. Hebrews 10, please, would you mind going to Hebrews 10? Look at verse 5 through 7. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. That's off. Absolutely awesome. Glorious. Of extreme importance. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Magnificent. The altar that we're looking at here to the right, and I'm going to close with this if you don't mind for now, because even though most times I deal with the lampstand, I need a little more time with that, and I don't have the time this morning. But I, I, I do want to deal with the table of showbread. The table of showbread, the name for it is the table of faces, the bread of faces. Uh, for there we stand in the presence of the Lord. It represents the body of Christ, the bread of life. It represents our will, where our will is surrendered. Notice it has 12 loaves of bread that speak of his administrative work. He is the bread of life. And the priests sprinkled it daily with frankincense. And only the priests were allowed to eat of this bread. Therefore, it speaks of Christ once eaten, persecution will come to your life. The blessed bread of life himself said to us, the word will bring persecution. If there is no persecution, you have not eaten properly. But this is also where our will is surrendered. This is where we yield our will to the Lord. This is where we surrender. For this is the realm of the soul. I've surrendered my body. I've offered it as a living sacrifice. And now the blessed water of the Word has sanctified my being. And I am free from the realm of the flesh. I enter into the realm of the soul, and there's where my will and my intellect and my emotions must be surrendered. As I surrender my will to God, something amazing happens. The anointing comes. I've never known a time in my life, in all the 30 so years of ministry, gentlemen, I can surrender my body and no anointing comes. I can preach the Word of God, but when I yield my will, just like that, the power of God becomes reality. It's always amazed me. And so here's what I can tell you, if you're ready to receive it. The anointing does not function in the outer court. There is no anointing 
in the outer court. The anointing is for ministry. The outer court is a place of death. The holy place is a place of ministry. When I minister, the anointing is released. Now, I want to add this even though I wasn't planning on, but I will. There is no anointing in the Holy of Holies. I don't need the anointing in the Holy of Holies. It's not the place of service. It's a place of worship. A place of communion. You say, what do you mean by that? I need the anointing for ministry. It's a big difference between a big difference between the anointing and the presence of God. The presence of God is not dependent on the anointing. But ministry is. I need no, no anointing to die. That requires a decision. Please, I beg of you, listen to me. It was a decision that brought me to the gate. And a decision that brought me to the cross. And a decision that brings me to the word of God. But only the anointing can get me in here. I can't just decide to walk in. I must be anointed to walk in. And when I walk in, the, uh, the anointing is released. The moment I yield my will. And the moment I yield my will, something else happens. And this is something that most wouldn't even think about unless reminded. I read the Bible every day. I ask for the cleansing of the blood every day. I come to Jesus every day. Jesus, cross, word, every day. But you and I will never experience the presence of God in the outer court. It's a place of death. And I can, I can read this precious word, and I can be cleansed from the dirt that has touched my walk. Now, I can leave right here. I can say, I'm done, Lord, and walk out. I've received nothing except liberty. That's good enough. But there's a lot more. Say there's a lot more. My brother, it's not enough to be free. There's a lot more than liberty. Because liberty, all liberty is, is the taking away of what the devil put on my life. I've still not received additional blessings. I've been free from the chains, thank God. But there's more to it than just being free from chains. Being free from the power of sin. There's a whole lot more. There's a whole lot more for being washed from the dirt that has touched my life every day. Because this is not the place of growth. This is the place of death. There is no growth in the outer court. There's only death. Growth happens right in here. Because here, I am fed. Here, I experience true feasting upon the bread of life. You say, what do you mean by that? Can I ask you a question? There are times you read the Bible... And you feel clean. That's the labor. How many times have you read the Bible and felt truly fed? You got something. You ate something. Something you live with and use for your life. Put your hands up high. That cannot happen at the labor. It happens right here. And do you remember when you really ate? You surrendered your will to him? Where there was a surrender of your will. Your will was surrendered to his will. At that moment, supernaturally, he began to feed your soul with his word. And you walked out. And to this day, you remember that moment. 
You may not remember what you read at the Leva. Because all it did is wash you. You'll never forget what you received at the table. You remember that day when Jesus spoke to you. You remember that day when the Word of God came alive. You remember that day when God gave you a blessed word that changed your day and changed your week and changed your life ever since. That happened right there, here. And here is where the anointing came alive. For it was there where you felt the anointing of God when you had your Bible open. You didn't feel the anointing here. You didn't know the anointing here. But when he got in there, the anointing came alive, and the Word of God came alive with it. And with that, I close and continue tonight. Somebody say hallelujah. Let's stand up, please. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your hands. Say, Lord, I want to come in all the way. Come on. All the way, Lord. All the way, Jesus. Great is thy faithfulness. Everything in the organ, Cheryl. Everything in the instruments. Lift your hands to him. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. the Lord always becomes rich when I teach on the Ark of the Covenant. Don't miss it tonight. Expect tonight to receive from heaven. And the people said amen. You've been listening to another of Pastor Benny's dynamic and life-changing teachings. Additional copies are available to you from Benny Hinn Ministries World Healing Center Church. Covenant partners of Pastor Benny supply not only daily television programs to countless millions, but help bring miracle crusades to cities around the world. For more information or to become a partner, contact Benny Hinn Ministries World Healing Center Church, Post Office Box 162000, Irving, Texas 75016. Call 800 433 1900 or go online to www.bennyhinn.org. If you live outside the United States or Canada, go to www.bennyhinn.org for the address and phone number of the office nearest you.